welcome everybody and apologies um, to those who have been on the line that we are starting a couple of minutes late. We were just having a couple of technical issues, but I think we're back on track again. Um, we'll just give everybody a minute or two to join us uh, in, um, in the webinar room. Okay, we've got people coming online. Thanks everybody for your time this afternoon. Um, my name's Mandy Davidson and I have the pleasure of chairing today's session on behalf of Marinus Link. Um, I'm joined by Katie Watt, who is the Senior Principal Environmental Consultant with Tetra Tech Coffee, who is supporting Marinus Link with the environmental approval process. And we will be um, joined by Ben White, who's the Executive Manager of Stakeholder Relations, Land um, and Environment, who will provide an overview of the project. Katie's going to kick us off by um, providing you with um, uh, some information about the assessment process. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, environmental approvals process um, and uh, the assessment process that the project will go through. Um, and then Ben will provide a project overview and we'll have some time for Q&As at the end of the session. Um, hopefully we can now have the presentation um, shared on the screen. So just a little bit of housekeeping um, to move through before we start. Um, Firstly, we ask that everybody keep their microphones on mute for the duration of the session. Uh, we'd encourage you to raise any questions that you have using the Q&A tool. You can access uh, your microphone and the Q&A tool on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please um, submit questions through the Q&A tool at any time during the session and we'll be answering these after the presentation along with um, some of the questions that you submitted when you registered for the webinar. We'd also encourage you to like any questions that are posted um, to let us know what are the topics that we should focus on um, most in the Q&A. We'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can and we'll record all of the outstanding questions um, to follow up after the webinar. So I'm now going to hand over to Katie who's going to give you an overview of the assessment process. Thanks very much, Katie. Thank you, Mandy. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I firstly would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all um, coming together from today. I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, emerging and future, and pay my respects to all traditional owners on the call with us today. I am coming to you from Wurundjeri country um, and uh, what a beautiful day it is here uh, in Melbourne on the banks of the Yarra River today. Um, so thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm just going to run you through the um, environmental approvals just at a high level today to give you some context for uh, the um, some guidelines and assessment guidelines that are going to be released for public comment shortly. So because Marinus Link does span um, from Tasmania through Bass Strait and to Victoria, it covers three jurisdictions. It has planning and environmental approvals processes to consider under all of those three jurisdictions. In 2021, um, we submitted referrals under the Environment Effects Act, under the um, Environment Planning and Biodiversity Conservation Act to start off those approvals processes. Um, under both of those uh, assessment processes, it was determined that an environment effects statement should be prepared for the Victorian component and environmental impact statement for the Commonwealth component. For the Tasmanian component this year, a development application was submitted to Burnie City Council and a referral was submitted to the Tasmanian EPA to consider the subsea cable um, and the converter station. Uh, the Tasmanian EPA has determined that both components should be assessed and an environmental impact statement prepared for those components as well, which will then inform Bernie City Council's assessment of the project. So the image you have on the screen um, is outlining 
the different steps and the different uh, legislations and approvals that apply across these three jurisdictions for the project. I, on the next slide, we then go into a little bit more detail about the steps um, in the Commonwealth process. As I just mentioned, we submitted a referral late last year and it was determined that assessment is required under the Commonwealth EPBC Act. So the next stage is to um, prepare an environment effects statement, sorry, environment impact statement. That'll be guided by assessment guidelines, which the Minister for Environment will, um, will issue. Those guidelines are going on exhibition shortly and will be available for comment um, from the community. Then the next stage after that, we'll be launching into the detailed uh, impact assessment to meet those guidelines, of which that document then will also be released for public comment and engagement on all of the issues through the development of that EIS. The next process that will run concurrently is the Victorian assessment process. An environment effects statement or EES is going to be prepared the, uh, similarly to the Commonwealth process, a set of assessment guidelines are being prepared and they will also be released for public comment shortly. They are called scoping requirements. So when they're finalised um, and released for public comment, we will then commence with preparing for EES. So that will be impact assessments undertaken um, and then also that document will be exhibited for public comment. And through preparing that EES, engagement will be undertaken to make sure that it's, it's understood what the impacts and issues are for delivering the project in Victoria. That EES will go on public exhibition together with the EIS um, prepared under the Commonwealth legislation. And then finally, the Tasmanian process, similarly, um, there will be a um, set of guidelines prepared that will reflect the level of assessment nature of the assessment to be undertaken as determined by the Tasmanian EPA. Those guidelines also will be on exhibition shortly for public comment. So an EIS will be prepared for the Tasmanian component um, and be put on public display for comment as well. So we will have the assessments in all three jurisdictions being undertaken um, concurrently at the same time so that all three sets of documents can be released for comment at the same time so that everyone can see the whole um, scope of the project and all of the impacts and how they're going to be managed. So these assessments will um, cover a whole range of disciplines, which you can see on the screen there. There'll be detailed studies undertaken for all of these topics and they will all come together uh, in a big set of documents um, to be released for public comment. So just a little bit more detail about the timelines. Um, the guidelines, all three sets of guidelines will be on uh, public display shortly. Um, they will be, you will be able to access those um, from the Marinus Link website. There will be a link then off to the different jurisdictions and the, the um, web pages where comments can be can be made. We'll be preparing an EIS to bring all of these three assessments together. That will be um, going on public exhibition mid to late next year to seek public comment and then go through the um, assessment process. Um, we're expecting to have a, receive a decision by mid 2024, which does seem like quite a long, <laughs> long time, but when you consider the scale of the project and the level of assessment that needs to be undertaken and then the process after which you've done the assessments for all of that to be reviewed and critiqued and assessed, it takes it does take quite a bit, bit of time, which you would expect for a large significant project like this. And I think that covers it. Thank you, Mandy. 
Thanks very much, uh, Katie. And we'll provide some details at the end of the webinar on where you can go uh, to make those comments. So, Katie, before we um, jump off the topic of the environmental assessment process, we did have a couple of questions came through from people who registered, um, which I think you'll be able to help us with. So in terms of the um, early assessments that the team has done to inform the EES, what are the sorts of impacts um, that might be expected on native habitat onshore in Victoria? Thank you, Mandy. So the assessments that have been done to date is looking at the baseline assessment to understand what uh, flora and fauna is present so that when the project is constructed subject to getting approval, it's understood what would be impacted. So either directly impacted by the removal or indirectly impacted by being adjacent to construction. So some of the impacts that will be looked at would be removal of native vegetation, of habitats or threatened species, um, of runoff to water quality, uh, to waterways and impacts on water quality. So there's detailed studies looking at terrestrial components and aquatic components and how the activities that are going to be undertaken through construction, how they would um, interface or interact with those values. Thanks, Katie. Um, and a similar question, what impacts do you anticipate there might be on some of the local towns? That's, that's another key area of focus for the impact assessments. So that we'll be looking at things like uh, traffic movements, so the construction traffic getting to and from um, the construction corridor. They'll be looking at noise. We'll be looking at air quality. So looking at the proximity of construction and, and the construction activities to the towns and how um, and if there is potential impacts. Um, There'll also be a social impact assessment that will look more broadly at the impacts on agriculture the, and the impacts on the towns and other uses in the area where the project is going to be, was proposed to be constructed. So um, it's actually quite all, all encompassing the impact assessments, even though we do break it up into lots of specific disciplines. It will, the purpose of the AES is to bring it all together to look holistically at the, the impact for the broader community. I and should also say, sorry, Mandy, it's also looking for benefits as well. I guess impacts is used in terms of positive and, and negative. Thanks very much, Katie. I'm now going to ask um, Stephen Clark to turn his camera back on. Apologies, I switched him off when, uh, when he joined. Um, and introduce um, Stephen. So Stephen is the project director for Marinus Link. Um, and Stephen is going to give us a little bit of an overview of the project um, about Marinus Link and why it's needed, as well as the timeline for the project. Stephen, do we have you with us still? Uh, I am here. I can't turn the video back on. I think you need to do it back as well, looking at this. Okay, no worries. Uh, Bear with me for a second. Well, there we go. Good stuff. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Clark, the project director, and I'll take you through a little bit about um, who we are and what we're doing and why we think Marinus Link is needed. So I'll let um, M start. Okay, so first off, who is Marinus Link? Um, so we are a subsidiary company of TAS Networks. Um, uh, we are set, have been set up specifically to develop um, and progress uh, Project Marinus. Uh, and TAS Networks is a Tasmanian government business uh, which owns and operates and maintains the electricity network uh, in Tasmania, both the transmission and the distribution side. When it comes to Marinus Link, um, what we're proposing is um, a 1500 megawatt HVDC, um, high voltage direct current, two-way interconnector between Tasmania and Victoria. Uh, it'll also have a telecommunications uh, cable uh, as well as part of that one. Um, the, the cable will make up uh, about 250 kilo 55 kilometres of undersea, a marine cable, and about 90 kilometres of underground cable in Victoria. Uh, at each end, uh, we'll have to convert the direct current 
power to alternating current, which is what the networks either side um, use. So both Victoria and Tasmania, most networks um, transport their power using alternating current. So we have to convert that at each end. So we have a converter stations um, at Haybridge near Burnie uh, and also at the Latrobe Valley um, near Hazelwood. Uh, the optical fibre yeah, will, will um, allow the two converter stations to, to communicate with each other and ensure efficient power transfer, but there will also be uh, additional capacity there for um, internet traffic as well, commercial internet traffic. Um, when we talk about the 1500 megawatts, just to put that in, in, um, in context, that's about the same size as the uh, former Hazelwood power station uh, in the Latrobe Valley. So it's quite a material size. Um, it's actually going to be made up of two stages. Uh, two 750 megawatt stages, just like the um, the Hazelwood power station. It was made up of a number of, of individual generators. Um, Mariners think we made up of two stages, both are 750 megawatts in size. And there will be staggered um, uh, construction and, and in service. So first stage is planned to be in service around the 28-29 financial year. Uh, and the second stage to so the 30-31 uh, financial year. Okay, so a little bit more detail on Mariners Link itself. Uh, so it's plugging into the Tasmanian power system at the transmission voltage at 220,000 volts. Uh, and we'll need a new line coming down from the existing line. There will be a, a switching station built at the Haybridge site, and then we'll have got that converter uh, there. And you see, they've got the two undersea cables. Uh, a, uh, a potential uh, a transition point um, well, there's this may be a transition point, that's, uh, but whether it's above ground or below ground, we're trying to make it um, below ground, but that will depend on the suppliers of the cable. Uh, we then have a converter station, as I mentioned, that converts the, um, the direct current back to the alternating current. We'll need a switching station uh, on the Victorian side as well, and we're hooking into the 500 kV transmission lines that, uh, that go from the Latrobe Valley into Melbourne. So a really strong part of the network. Uh, the, well, we're bundling fiber optic cable with each of the power cables. Uh, that is, as I said, is required to make sure that the control systems of the, of the uh, converter stations can talk to each other. But being optical fiber, there's actually plenty of extra capacity there. And so we'll be able to use that extra capacity to um, further increase the capacity, uh, data capacity between Tasmania and Victoria, and add in additional redundancy. Um, so we'll have two separate cables, which will go, I guess, uh, add to the two existing Telstra cables and the Basslink cable. Uh, so that will increase the competition uh, um, and availability of data for commercial uh, provision. Um, why do we need Marinus Link? Well, you've probably seen or heard on the, on the, uh, the news that uh, the thermal generators are getting to the end of their um, service life and are starting to retire. I mentioned the aforementioned Hazelwood power station got the end of its life and retired a couple of years ago. Um, there are other power stations um, such as Yulon and uh, in Victoria and say Araring uh, in New South Wales, uh, which have signaled that they're planning to retire. Uh, and in fact, if you look to um, by 2035, there's going to be 24,000 megawatts um, of thermal generation retiring in the East Coast power grid. Um, and to put that in context, uh, the peak demand in Victoria, I think it's around about 10,000 megawatts. Um, so you can see there that it's a, a very substantial uh, amount of the existing generation that supplies um, particularly Victoria and New South Wales, is looking at retiring by 2035. Um, which in itself is fine, uh, except we need something to replace it. Um, the most cost-effective solution now for replacing coal-fired generation is actually renewables, which is great. Um, um, however, you need more of them uh, because um, solar and wind doesn't operate as much. So the so solar wind only operates generally during when it's sunny. Um, and wind also operates you know, maybe 30 to 40% of the time. Uh, um, we need more of the wind and solar on a per megawatt install basis to be equivalent to those 24,000 megawatts of thermal generation. Um, and even though um, they've got that sort of intermittency, 
Also, there are days uh, when it's cloudy and days when it's still. Uh, that needs to be some sort of storage as well, um, the store, the solar, and the store, the wind to go through those patches of time when it's not windy uh, and not sunny. Uh, and while we've also, um, this is all that comes from the Australian Energy Market Operator, is flagging there's going to be like up to 1,000, sorry, 1,100, 11,000 megawatts, the right numbers here, 11,000 megawatts of behind the meter battery installations. Uh, uh, we'll also need some large grid scale. Um, storage and what uh, AMOS is suggesting is that we need 21,000 megawatts of grid scale dispatchable capacity, storage capacity uh, and that's where Marinus comes in. Um, we are 1500 megawatts uh, of that 21,000 uh, megawatts. So we are a part of the solution, we're not the only part of the solution, we certainly still need to be um, lots of other uh, forms of storage uh, whether that's um, um, hydro store, um, pumped hydro on, on the, what we call the mainland, uh, whether it's um, other large style batteries. Um, and in reality, there may well need to be some gas fire generation in there as well, because uh, um, that's um, a lot of, of storage required. Uh, and Marinus has become as one part of that. Um, I spoke about um, AEMO, um, so Australian Energy Market Operator. Each two years, they go and look at the power systems in its entirety and say, well, what do we need from a transmission perspective, generation and storage perspective? Um, and the ISP this year came out and said that uh, under all the scenarios Marinus is needed uh, as part of the optimal development plan for the national grid uh, and it's needed as soon as possible. Um, so uh, uh, it's really it's a, a, a very valuable contributor to um, keeping the cost or putting downward pressure on prices uh, across the national electricity market. Um, okay, I presume I've been told to hurry up here, so I'm moving further fast. Um, so in terms of how um, Marinus is going to work, uh, the first 750 megawatts is really using existing spare capacity in the Tasmanian power system. So the hydro uh, schemes at the moment cannot get all their power um, across Basslink. Um, or Basin gets constrained and there's still capacity left. Um, so uh, we're going to use the uh, spare capacity of the existing generation, hydro generation. Um, uh, hydro is also looking at, um, uh, and it's got some funding to upgrade the Taralia um, scheme. Uh, and so that's going to have additional capacity to the network. Uh, also hydro is looking at existing um, power station upgrades, uh, particularly on the West Coast, um, which will extract more capacity out of existing generators through upgrades to the turbines uh, there. And we've also got um, significant wind capacity developments uh, in Tasmania. Um, and Tasmania has some really good wind, uh, has really high what they call capacity factors. So it runs more often than not, um, uh, it's generating some power. So um, all that contributes to that first uh, link uh, and making sure that we've got capacity that we can support uh, and back up uh, renewables uh, on the mainland. Uh, we'll also be importing um, some, some solar power from Victoria to Tasmania as well. Um, so that one's targeted 28, 29, as it says there. The second link um, is all about supporting uh, new pumped, long duration pumped hydro. Um, the, the Hydro Tasmania has flagged, identified that their preferred location is Lake Sathana uh, for this first uh, pumped hydro scheme. They do have a few other options as well, but they think that one is the most economic and a uh, uh, preferable one to develop first. Uh, and so that, that brings the firming capability, the second link. Um, the second link also promotes additional wind capacity. And as I mentioned before, Tasmania has some really good uh, high capacity wind resources um, that we can help uh, that transition to the renewable energy. Uh, and so the second link unlocks about 1200 megawatts of that additional uh, capacity. And we're looking to have that link in service by 2030. 31. Um, there are some challenges uh, with Marinus, and one of them uh, is that the current uh, cost allocation methodology for transmission uh, in the, uh, the national electricity market is based on, on which, effectively, which states the, the assets are in, rather than which customers actually benefit uh, there. Um, so Marinus Link um, supports the whole of the East Coast uh, power system. Uh, it provides downward pressure on prices across the entire NEM. However, under the current framework, the, the costs of 
Maris that can only be recovered from Tasmania and Victoria. Um, that becomes a problem uh, in terms of Tasmania's relatively small customer base. Uh, and we are working with um, the various um, jurisdictions, the uh, rule makers and governments um, around seeing whether we can change the rules to make a bit fairer uh, allocation of the costs that more closely align with where the benefits are for Mariners Link. Okay. Uh, so as well as the economic and direct market benefits that we, we talk about in this economic analysis, uh, there are also lots of other significant uh, broader economic benefits. Um, so uh, during the construction, uh, I'm in Victoria, we'll be um, now investing a lot of money uh, into the Victorian economy. Um, um, that through its multiplier effects is a $1.5 billion uh, economic stimulus um, through the direct and indirect jobs. Uh, also, we're talking about 1,400 uh, extra jobs. Uh, in the area. And somewhat similarly uh, in Tasmania, when you take um, uh, not only the Marinus but also the supporting transmission developments in Tasmania, once again, we're also seeing 1.4 billion of economic stimulus and about 1,400 jobs uh, um, during the peak construction periods. And um, uh, as well as those jobs and growth, uh, we also have that uh, unlocking uh, or reducing the CO2 emissions because uh, the, really the, the Without Marinus, um, there would need to be more, um, effectively gas fire generation primarily, but more th um, thermal generation used to do, but to provide that backup uh, to wind and solar. Um, so we are um, certainly helping the, the government um, and the nation achieve its uh, emissions reductions targets. Okay. Um, so I talked a bit about the timelines when we things um, are going to be finished, but let's talk about some of the intermediate steps. So we're what's in, in what's called the design and approval stage, uh, where we are seeking to get our various approvals, uh, one of which is obviously environmental land use planning approvals. Uh, we're also um, looking at getting our regulatory revenue approvals and also getting ready to have our construction contracts ready to award. Uh, and so we're actually about ready to release our tenders as we speak. Um, this process um, was probably another couple of years worth. Um, by the time we get, our aim is to, by the end of December 2024, have all our, our approvals to construct and operate uh, the link, um, have our contracts ready to execute uh, in there, have our revenue decisions on the energy regulator, uh, and have our debt and equity um, all, our sources all lined up so we can have our final investment decision and start moving into the um, what we call the manufacturing, construction and commissioning phase um, in there. So we've some preparation before that, uh, some early works, but that will start in earnest, earnest uh, from about uh, uh, 2025. And it's about four years to actually um, build uh, one of these uh, links um, for a combination of time to manufacture the cable, which is, well, this one is one of the longer lead time items, as well as the converter stations. Uh, there. Uh, our expectation is that um, that first link will be ready um, uh, to start transmitting power in late 2028. Um, but then there's a commissioning process that will take um, probably the, between uh, six and nine months to release the full capacity of that link, first link, and then we'll be in service and we'll be staggering the second one so that uh, once we've finished um, or the key parts of the construction, we'll go swing into the manufacturing construction of the second link. Um, and so that will follow about two years later uh, with that comm uh, commissioning and going into service. And in terms of the uh, land route um, in Victoria, uh, we are proposing to have the Shore Crossing and Waratah Bay. Um, and uh, then we wind our way up to uh, potentially Hayeswood uh, as being the um, essentially ultimate location, although we are investigating um, a site at Driftfield which re reduce the cable length by about 12 kilometres. Um, uh, we've picked a route um, balancing a range of, of conditions and stakeholders uh, interests in there. Uh, we've done a whole search in terms of environmentally sensitive areas and uh, issues. We've looked at uh, uh, European and Aboriginal heritage in there. We've also looked at the geology um, of the landscape uh, and balancing all those things, we've identified a preferred route um, as shown on this diagram um, that gets us from the shore crossing um, up to the power grid, anything to the power grid, either Driftfield or Hazelwood. 
Um, at the uh, Victorian end, uh, we'll have, uh, actually both ends, we'll have the converter stations. This is a bit of an artist's impression um, of what they look like. Um, they, um, I describe them somewhat as a big, two big bunning sheds, uh, which hold uh, the electronics, which you can see on the right-hand side there, the, the smarts, uh, the transistors that convert uh, the power from alternating current to direct current and back again. Uh, if anyone's got a, um, a caravan that they run on batteries and have a, a an inverter that, that creates uh, 240 volts uh, for them. This is a sort of same sort of thing, but much on, a, on an industrial scale. The two buildings hold electronics. There's some cooling fans um, and some offices and um, and uh, and a few other auxiliary bits there. Uh, and in the background, you can see the um, the switchyards um, um, and a few storage sheds and so forth. Okay. Um, in terms of the construction, the short crossing, uh, our plan is to do what's called a horizontal directional drilling. Um, so we bore underneath uh, the sand dunes, underneath the beach, and draw out and go out to about the 10 metre mark um, out in the Waratah Bay uh, there. Um, and at the completion of that, uh, we'll have a, um, a transition state, a transition point where we transition from the sea cable. Uh, to a land cable. There are actually different designs of cables uh, in there, so there'll be no interference or um, damage to the dunes or beach. Uh, they will be going from uh, behind those two and doing that drilling out to sea. Okay, in terms of the sea construction, um, the, uh, the cable is brought out. Um, they can fit around about 150 kilometres of cable on a ship. Uh, it is um, laid on from the ship, laid on to the bottom of the uh, Bass Strait by the ocean there. And then uh, a second ship comes along and then buries the cable. Uh, and we'll be burying somewhere between a metre and a metre and a half below. And it's um, done, there's a couple of different methods. Uh, this, is, this is one method, this is a jet treacher method, uh, where it uses jets of, of high pressure water uh, to bury the cable. Um, there's also a ploughing method as well, which we're not shown here. Um, most of the Bass Strait uh, is uh, quite soft sediments, um, sand or mud uh, or light clays. Uh, and so we think that, that, mo that most of it will be able to be done by this method, which is um, fairly cost effective and not that intrusive. Uh, okay. The assessment process, and I suspect this is where I'm handing over to someone else. Actually, no, we are coming back online now for some questions. So okay. I've got Katie joining me. Thanks very much, Stephen. And we're just going to bring um, Ben on. So I'm going to ask him to start his video. Welcome, Ben. Um, I'm going to change your name so that people know that you're not <laughs> Emily. <laughs> Fantastic. So we'll um, kick off, Stephen, I think, with a question for you. So um, we had a question come in before the session. What sort of infrastructure will be above the ground and where will it be? Okay. Um, so the main thing, well, the, the only spot really where we're going to have material amounts of in, uh, above ground infrastructure is at the converter stations. Um, we will have um, along the cable route joint pits which are uh, buried. Um, occasionally, we might need to have a little box above the ground um, uh, for testing the cable, um, but I'm talking very small there. But most of the cable infrastructure is, is all, all buried. Our intention is that the transition joint um, between the land and sea will be buried as well. Um, so it is really the converter stations, which will be the obvious one. Uh, and I said that um, a few link boxes, which are, I think will be above ground, but only just. Thanks, Stephen. And probably a follow up for that one um, for you with regard to construction. Um, a question from Barb in the Q&A. Why not construct both cables at the same time to minimise the impact of the construction phase on landowners? Uh, okay, excellent question. Um, so we are going to try to do as much as possible. Um, we aim is to do the trenching at the same time uh, and put conduits in the ground. Um, however, we don't think we can actually get enough cable fast enough to actually lay all the cable at the same time. Um, so we'll, um, we'll only be able to do one, one stage first uh, and then the second stage a little bit later, but we won't need to retrench. Uh, we'll be able to, we'll have to dig up some, build some joint bays potentially 
which are uh, sort of box concrete boxes in the ground the ground um, but then we're going to pull in the cable as the second cable later but we're aiming certainly to minimize the amount of disruption by doing the trenching um, at the same time Thanks very much, Stephen. And Ben, this one might be for you. We've actually got a couple of questions in the Q&A relating to the um, optic fibre cable. So one of them says they heard that the um, fibre will be connected to Telstra and is wondering if Telstra has entered an exclusive agreement around that. Um, and a follow-up question being, um, when will the vendor for that be selected? Sure. Well, the quick answer to that is no, we haven't had any connection agreement or commercial negotiation with Telstra. I can quickly, if it's not already been covered, but just reiterate the fact that optic fibre for Marinus Link, which is also always part of transmission infrastructure, so the machine, if you like, can communicate with itself. This optic fibre component with Marinus actually enhances um, the diversity and the what we call redundancy um, ability within that telecommunications network that we've got uh, in Australia and between Tasmania and Victoria. So no commercial discussion um, has been reached with any uh, user or provider. We're at those very early stages having just completed a commercial strategy around that and we're looking forward to disclosing some of the key insights from that. What it looks like for telecommunication customers is really favourable. It's, uh, as I said, greater diversity, um, greater competition, which will lead to lower prices, but the reliability is significant. So we will enhance uh, the reliability of uh, telecommunications. And in South Gippsland in particular, we noted a report from Infrastructure Australia recently, which identified major infrastructure gaps for that region. And the top priority gap is bandwidth and mobile coverage. So our optic fibres will enhance and help to address that problem and that gap. And it'll also open up opportunities then for local businesses, even the agricultural sector to switch over into smart automated systems, distributed energy. Uh, the, the list is almost endless as we move to digitise and electrify the economy. So I hope that helps answer that question. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, this is probably one for either Ben or Stephen um, asking about the beach at Waratah Bay. This one came in before the sessions. Uh, what will the disruption to the beach at Waratah Bay be? Uh, do you want to go first, Ben, or shall I? I, I can start <laughs> and then yeah. Stephen add sort yeah. of more technical yeah. dimensions. So. Um, as Stephen was outlining in the presentation, uh, our construction methods in the way we're assessing them and considering them will always seek to mitigate, minimise or avoid impact. And we know Waratah Bay uh, is highly valuable, uh, both socially, culturally, um, but also economically in that region. We're fortunate enough to have some construction methods at our disposal um, to to avoid that impact. We'll be looking to use a method called horizontal directional drilling, where we have a drill rig sitting uh, inshore. So about 700 metres to a kilometre inshore, running um, that HDD system below the sensitive um, dunes beach to then surface out to the cable laying vessel, which sits about a kilometre offshore. So we plan to completely avoid impact on the beach, um, but we will also need to consider um, constructability risk and issues uh, the closer we get um, our technical designs in place. But the short of it is um, it's a, it's a minimise, if not mitigate um, measure that we're looking to conduct there and we'll be very um, sensitive to how we conduct our uh, activities, not only at Waratah Bay, but all through the cable route uh, into the Latrobe Valley. That horizontal directional drilling construction method will also be deployed where we may come uh, to sensitive tracts of native vegetation um, or um, other sort of key water bodies and potentially cultural heritage sites that we, um, we realise and we need to avoid. 
Yeah. The only thing I'll add to that is uh, I've been asked how deep is the cable that goes under the beach, and uh, we haven't got a final design, but it'll be at least 10 metres, maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 metres deep uh, as it goes under the beach. So uh, no chance of it, no, someone digging it up when they're doing, making sandcastles. Thanks, Stephen and Ben. Um, ben, this is probably one for you too. Um, this has come up um, at webinars that we've run um, previously and I know is topical in Victoria. Um, what's the uh, estimated cost of underground HVDC compared to going overhead? And um, I guess as a follow up to that, why has Mariners Link chosen to go underground in Victoria? Sure, I mean, it's, it's a... Um useful question it's it needs a bit of unpacking so perhaps just bear with me while we unpack that I'm not going to jump straight to the cost equation because there's a lot more to it than just a simple cost equation so we conducted a, a pretty rigorous and multi-criteria assessment of the different options from um, tracking Marinus Link literally through from the sea into the Latrobe Valley uh, we, we looked at everything from placing converter stations, those um, what Stephen uh, affectionately referred to as those Bunning warehouse sheds. Uh, we, we looked at converting the direct current cabling into the alternating current network closer down towards Waratah Bay, um, where we were looking at the prospect of running overhead AC from um, southern end of the route back up into the Latrobe Valley. We looked at that. We also looked at undergrounding AC at that time as well. Um, we also looked at running direct current overhead and running that all the way through to the Latrobe Valley. So we've looked at all the varieties, but the, the key factors here, um, not just cost, but the key factors here are around moving this significant amount of energy over large distances um, safely, reliably, and minimising losses. That was one of the key criteria. Another is looking at um, the, uh, the impact from the converter stations on a sensitive location like in and around Waratah Bay. That wasn't very favourable in terms of us being able to get uh, the required land use and environmental approvals. So we needed to look at variations of where our converter stations would be located as well. And we also uh, had a fundamental um, consideration where we aren't looking to connect any new generation or storage facility directly into Marinus Link on its way into the Latrobe Valley. And that's a really key point for people to understand. When we're talking about connecting new wind, new solar, new hydro or pumped hydro, those connections need to be made into the alternating um, current network. That's the most cost effective way um, and the most technically prudent way to do that. So we'll be doing that in Tasmania where we're looking to connect new wind, whether onshore or offshore, some solar, but also that hydro uh, and pumped hydro capacity that Stephen would have covered in the presentation. So we need, we need that overhead AC development to occur in Tasmania, like we're seeing on, main, on the mainland where uh, new projects need to connect. We have the benefit with Marinus Link to run direct current um, all the way from Tasmania into the Latrobe Valley, and it ended up being cost neutral to, to a large extent for us to continue our uh, um, high voltage direct current cabling from the sea underground all the way into, into the valley. So without going into the specif specifications around cost, I guess the, the short of it is um, it was um, cost marginal for us to go underground, but for all of those other reasons, safe, reliable, sort of bulk movement of significant amount of energy, 1500 megawatts at any given time, and to do, to do that where we're not looking to connect any um, generational storage projects directly into our asset. Thanks very much, Ben, and appreciate you taking the time um, to, under, uh, to explain that that's not necessarily a straightforward answer. Katie, I'm going to throw this one to you, um, and it's a little bit theoretical because 
um, we know that the project is still in early planning. So there are some questions that um, can't be answered particular to the project today, but I'll, I'll ask it in a way that might shed some insight into how it's usually done. Um, so the question is around offsetting emissions created by the project. Um, and I'm hoping you might be able to just provide some insights into the way that emissions from a project like Marinus Link are assessed through the environmental assessment process and then how you look at um, mitigating those, noting that it won't necessarily be the mitigation for Marinus Link, but a bit of an example of how that's sometimes addressed. Thanks, Mandy. So one of the assessments that will be part of uh, the AES is a greenhouse gas emissions assessment. So it will look at the emissions um, in accordance with the National um, Environmental Guidelines for um, assessing emissions. We'll look at the emissions from um, the materials used, from uh, vehicles and machinery used in construction, and for bringing things and materials to the site. So overall, there'll be an assessment in terms of tonnes of CO2 um, emitted from the materials and the construction of the project. So then that means we can look at, at where there's opportunities to use lower emissions materials or lower emissions um, vehicles and fuels in construction. Um, and uh, that's the first step is to try and minimise or to avoid. And then there's schemes for offsetting emissions um, to balance out what is emitted. Um, so that'll be something that the EES will, will quantify um, and then the Marinus Link team will work with the contractors about ways to minimise to minimise that. Thanks, Katie. And that's a nice lead in, um, Stephen. I think this one is probably for you. Um, we had an earlier question about whether there are any opportunities to be involved in early works and then a follow up in the Q&A about um, how local businesses might access upcoming tender opportunities. So I have put a link in to the ICN gateway to answer that, but perhaps if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the tender process and the timeline for that, Stephen. Okay, thanks, Mandy. Um, so the tender line, timeline, we're actually going out to tender for the converter stations first uh, in September uh, and then the cable uh, in November. Um, uh, in this first round, we're not asking the, the suppliers to lock in with their, their local suppliers. But what we are stressing uh, to the, the supplier, the, the converter and cable manufacturers, is that um, Australian participation and regional participation uh, is really important to us in the project uh, and um, has, has a very high weighting uh, in the evaluation criteria. And we're expecting them to um, demonstrate how they and how they're going to maximize um, both Australian content, uh, content and regional uh, content uh, in their proposals. And our expectation is that they will be looking at reaching out um, to uh, local uh, suppliers uh, for both the early works and also the construction phase. And I think we've actually been talking uh, around actually facilitating some sessions where when the tender has come to look at the sites, um, we also see if we can actually have some sessions where they can engage with local uh, service providers as well um, to make sure that they've got um, those, those access as well as the, um, the, the gateways as well that you've talked about. Um, I think Ben's not in there. Do you want to also share some more on that, Ben? No, that's, I think that's good. I think it's worth noting the reality is we've got real challenges in terms of supply chains, not just our project, not just the electricity sector, but all infrastructure projects. And we're really well aware of that. That's why we're really uh, excited that we are uh, getting ourselves ready to go to tender on an international stage. These are big commitments uh, but the sooner we get ourselves uh, in that pipeline, the more assurance we um, have in terms of delivering this significant project um, sooner uh, than later. So we just know we have to do these things prudently. We also have to do these things in a very timely way to ensure we have um, the right spot in the right queue at the right time. And uh, that's what we've been working pretty feverishly for over the last uh, couple of years. But it's a great question. And really then back right down at a local level, it's fair to say 
a lot of the equipment um, that will be required for the converter stations and the cables themselves are specialist and there are only a very select few providers of that worldwide and uh, they're largely the track record is usually from either Europe or in um, in Asia and when it comes to local participation we're really excited to, to look at all opportunities in fact but we see a really clear and legitimate opportunity around our civil construction works um, being part of um, of the procurement process where we'll see local businesses in Gippsland or across Victoria participating in that um, quite quite readily. Thanks very much, Ben and Stephen. Um, Katie, another one for you, I think, and appreciate if we need to take this one on notice and get back to um, the person who's asked the question. Will the Victorian planning scheme amendments be considered concurrently with the EES and what's included in those? That's a good question. Um, so the project is proposing um, to undertake a planning scheme amendment um, subject to the Minister for Planning's views on, um, uh, on undertaking that process. Um, the project does go through two council jurisdictions, so there are multiple planning controls that could apply and a planning scheme amendment um, would be one way to streamline that and have consistent um, requirements across the project. Um, the current plan is to exhibit that with the EES, as is normally done for long linear projects going through multiple council areas. Um, so that will be um, uh, put on public display and um, comments sought through the exhibition process on the planning scheme amendment. Um, in terms of further details at this point, we're, we're still working through, through that and all of the um, controls that exist under each planning scheme to then propose a planning scheme amendment that's appropriate for the length of the, of the cable. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Katie. And I think this will probably be our last question. We don't have any more open questions in the Q&A, but there is still time um, if you have a, a burning question for the team. Um, ben, can you talk a little bit about how the project is working with local governments, um, particularly around um, community engagement and realising the benefits of the project locally? Sure. So, well, in Victoria, we certainly are... Um, liaising reasonably regularly with South Gippsland Shire, as well as the Latrobe City Council. They've been fabulous um, stakeholders to deal with here right from the beginning. And um, lots of insights to um, issues, constraints to work through. So we've had some really good dialogue around all of that over the last um, three to four years, in fact. So um, they're certainly a key player uh, in not just the way we, we go about our engagement, but I think uh, to the earlier question around a planning scheme amendment, even though local councils uh, in Victoria are not having a role in terms of planning decisions, they will inform those planning um, outcomes. Um, so they will be consulted on that through the planning scheme amendment process. Um, we are also just a bit broader than councils working with the likes of the Latrobe Valley Authority, who have also been extremely supportive and helpful for us to understand some of the key issues, but also opportunities to work through existing processes. And um, these local authorities, I guess, um, help us uh, look at ways where we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but we're also looking at ways we don't uh, burden or, um, if you like, uh, yeah, make unnecessary sort of asks on the community either because you know there's a lot going on in Gippsland and although it can be seen to be very exciting and a great opportunity it's also very fatiguing and sometimes very confusing for members of the public through these big sort of processes so councils play a key role um, we're always open and available uh, at their request to brief both councillors and their uh, teams um, and yeah, we'll be working with them all the way through this. 
Thanks very much, Ben. Those are all the questions that we have today. So I'd like to thank everybody who has attended today's session um, and particular thanks to Katie, Stephen uh, and Ben for your presentations and answering those questions. Uh, I'd encourage you all to visit the Mariners Link website to subscribe for updates about the project. Um, and you can also find out more there about the opportunities to provide feedback through the environmental assessment process. Um, you will be asked to fill out a short survey as we close the webinar and there's also an opportunity there for you to input your email so you can sign up for updates about the project. So once again, thank you for joining us all and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks everybody. Goodbye.